Ah. So welcome, everybody. My name's Guy Roth. I'm the Director of Northern Agriculture at the University of Sydney in Narrabri. This is our fourth session in our DigiFarm Expo. And today's session is Ag Tech from Cloud to Paddock, Digital Ag in Practice, Farm to International Fashion Market. But before we begin and I introduce our guest speaker, I'd like to acknowledge the Gamilaroi people who are the traditional custodians of the land where we meet today in Narrabri and pay respects to elders past and present. I'd also like to acknowledge and pay respects to all other traditional custodians and elders of the lands occupied by our Zoom participants. I recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationships with the land, which continue to be important to all Ad Aboriginal people living today. And welcome everybody to those listening online and those who will take the time to listen to our recording. I'd like to give a special welcome to David Statham, who's our guest speaker. And David is, is the director of Sundown Pastoral Company. He's one of the world's most renowned sustainable agricultural enterprises. And he's highly regarded as a thought leader, both in the cattle and cropping industries. And as you'll detect during David's presentation, he's got a real passion for technology that's really enabled the diversification of their agricultural enterprises right through the whole value chain, supply chain. Now we've got a two part presentation. I'm first of all gonna play a short eight minute video before, and then David will take over and run through his presentation. So now I'm, I'm now gonna play the video which runs for seven minutes. No sound, Guy. That's it. Since our first crop in 1988, we've expanded the property to 63,500 acres, of which 26,000 acres is irrigated. Over the past 20 years, we've averaged on an annual basis 52,000 bales of cotton. We have always been driven by best practice and eager to look at modern ways forward. Since 2003, we have collected impact data across soil carbon, water, energy and chemical use. Without the data, we couldn't improve. We need the transparency and insight. Soil carbon levels indicate how healthy your soil is. During the past 20 years, our soil carbon levels have increased creating healthier soils year on year. In our last third party audit, we are pleased to report we sequestered 400 kilos of carbon per bale. That's the equivalent of taking 9,000 cars off the road. We are the world's first carbon positive cotton farm. To achieve this, we implement practices such as zero to minimum tillage, precision planting technology, use of organic amendments, and strict and precise water use. We have combined this with smart farming techniques, which allow us to move forward at speed. We have implemented automated bankless channel irrigation. We utilize moisture probes through telemetry to map changes automatically and respond to them for the crop's health. We use precision spraying to ensure we spot spray weeds and dramatically reduce our chemical use. We have solar and renewable energy on farm. Today, we are the producers of Good Earth Cotton, the only carbon positive, traceable and renewable cotton in the world. Good Earth Cotton is fully traceable from this farm to the customer, even through reuse and recycle. We achieve this with the power of Fibre Trace, an advanced traceable technology. Fibre Trace combines physical and digital traceability with the power of authentication, aiming to empower the global textile industry to reduce its impact on the environment. You can see the fibers we grow with precision 
and data in real time as they travel throughout the supply chain to the customer's hands. Audited and authentic. We're proud to be turning negatives into positives. Moving to permanent beds like these has a lot of benefit to the soil. It means tractors run in the same wheel tracks every year, accurate to within centimetres, which keeps compaction to a minimum. We plant the cotton seeds precisely at optimal spacings. Then when the crop is finished, we mulch the plant stems to put that goodness back into the soil. We also add nutrients and organic amendments. All that organic matter means plenty of carbon, which feeds microorganisms essential for the soil. The higher the carbon level, the better the result. Also important is crop rotation. After cotton, we plant different crops such as wheat, which has a different root system, which helps improve the soil structure again. Most important of all, we use zero to minimal tillage. That keeps the soil in good condition because turning the soil releases carbon into the atmosphere. Soil is the second biggest carbon sink, second to the ocean, we have to look after it. The long-term aim of good earth cotton is to reach a soil carbon level that is equal or better than the natural state. The natural state to us is soil that has never been farmed, grazed or developed. The result is top quality, high yielding cotton. It's something we're very proud of. This is a special farm where we've installed four different irrigation systems to compare water efficiency. As far as we know, it's the only setup like it in Australia. Since 2012, we've halved our water use. Based on our tests, we've been converting to bankless channel irrigation, which relies on gravity and tiered terraces. It's better all round. At Good Earth Cotton, we're focused on smart farming. We use precision spray application to reduce our chemical use. We measure crop canopy temperature to determine plant stress, which increases the accuracy of our irrigation schedule. We apply fertiliser with precision technology to reduce use. We are now on the third generation of cotton with genetic pest control, which has a naturally occurring protein to kill bollworm, one of our main pests. Over 2.5% of our cropped cotton area is planted with natural pest management solutions, predominantly pigeon pea. When solar came out about 10 years ago, we invested a million dollars into panels. We then went again with three more solar facilities, investing another 300,000. But it's paid off. We've cut our energy bill from 130,000 down to 30 to 40,000 a year. Now we're thinking long term. Our plan in the next 12 months is to build a nine megawatt solar farm to run the cotton gin. Within five years, we want to be generating enough solar to produce our own hydrogen by electrolysis. We aim to be running off 95% renewable energy by 2027. Once we do that, we can convert the irrigation pumps and tractors to run off hydrogen and save 2 million litres of diesel every year. Eventually, we will be able to make our own fertiliser, all from renewable energy. No one is doing that yet. We can see it happening here within the next five years. Once the cotton has harvested, it comes here to the kid and separates the lint from the small fibres and seeds, as well as from stray bits of plant. The machine then cleans the lint and bows it up before it leaves the farm to be turned into fabric. But everything gets used. The seeds become oil or livestock fodder, while the tiniest fibres go to the pharmaceutical industry. Anything left over becomes compost. Our gin does something very unique in adding fibre trace to the cotton. Fibre trace is a luminescent pigment, the same high security technology found in banknotes and passports, and it bonds to the cotton for life. The amount added is so small, it is regarded as dust, but it is so powerful that at any stage of the global supply chain, it can be easily detected by a hand scanner, auditing and authenticating it's our cotton all the way to the garment on the shop floor. Fibre trace means that everyone can be sure it was grown right here at our farm. We believe we are the first carbon positive cotton farm and crop in the world. We are backed by the power of true traceability, combining the physical and the digital for the ultimate irrefutable authentication. We're proud to call ourselves Good Earth Cotton, turning negatives into positives. Thanks, Guy. <clears throat> You're right for me to talk yeah, now. Yeah, thanks very much for that, David, and, and welcome. Uh, I wore my best cotton shirt, and I really have no idea where the cotton came from, so I'm looking to learn more about the, the technology for you. There you go. Well, uh, thanks for the invitation, Guy. Um, I just thought we'd play that video. It's sort of... Um, it um, amplifies a lot of things that we're doing in a, in a quick story. The reason we put that video together 
is that we were going to uh, present in Amsterdam two years ago. And so we put a video together in, in the uh, Kingpins, which is the biggest denim show in the world, to present, you know, our farming techniques and, and, uh, and to present good earth cotton and to fibre trace. Um, why do we need to do that? Is because we need to educate brands. We need to ed educate consumers. We don't do a very good job of selling what we do and how good we do it. Because I think we do. Some of our farmers are doing some some of the most sustainable farming practices in the world, and we need to sell ourselves better. Where does all that direction come from? I suppose a little bit of background is, you know, I was lucky enough to have an opportunity in the family business. Um, invited in when I was seventeen, and. I've been with it ever since, and that was into the steel business. My father started in the 1950s called Rambuild. Um, the first thing I ever learnt was marketing first, second and third. Nothing else counts, son. That was the first day on the job, and I, 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 I still believe in that, and um, thus the reason for going into our own branding and, and the investment into Fibre Trace. Um, one of the comments that I'd like to make very early on is that uh, I think data is going to be king in the future. I think it's going to be an asset on our balance sheet and it's certainly undervalued today, but it will be certainly valued in the future. Without the data collection, we couldn't have done any of our branding or any of our storytelling because we wouldn't have been able to back it up with data. Um, quickly, before I get into a few slides and a presentation, just our mission, um, I've been very fortunate enough to enter a family business and uh, my my goal and my legacy is to leave it better than I found it. And I wanna leave the, the same thing with the planet. So that's what drives me. Um, and that's why we're doing what we're doing. Um, so I'll just get into share my screen and go to the um, presentation. I'll just share a few slides. Hopefully this works. Yep. That's working? Yep. So just to introduce Sundown Pastoral Company is the company we've um, branded our cotton, Good Earth Cotton, for all the reasons um, that was mentioned in the video. And we've also purchased a, a um, which was also in the video, the Fibre Trace business, of which I've got a few slides as well. I'm just going to start with a little short one minute video. It's um, a brand in America that was the first to use our cotton. Uh, sorry, second. Uh, the first was an Australian company, Nobody Denim in Melbourne. Um, but this is a little ad that the Americans put together with a uh, huge success. It's one of life's greatest mysteries. Since the dawn of time, it's been asked, where does stuff come from? <laughs> But have you ever wondered where your denim comes from? Turns out... Your jeans have come a long way! Our new denim collection, we added a first of its kind fibre traceability technology. So, follow its journey all the way from farm to pot. Fibre trace. How jeans are made. So... Yeah, no, um, we, uh, that was the first um, custom we had in America, of which they're going around the second year that actually used our cotton, went through the supply chain, uh, collected the data and told the story to the consumer. So we're pretty proud of that. Um, just going into um, just sharing some of these things with you. The world at the moment is all talk about uh, regenerative, uh, climate change, carbon, uh, renewable, regenerative. You can see all these slogans here that all through the world, um, you know, regenerative programs around the world. And so we've, that's what's been driving us is to try and decommoditize de our cotton and create something between uh, what we call sustainable and carbon positive, which is probably sit between conventional cotton and um, organic cotton. So that's, that's the objective. Um, obviously, there's two biggest sinks in the world is the oceans with carbon and the soil, and we control our soil. As farmers, uh, Nick spoke about many of the uh, concepts, farming procedures that we've, we've uh, taken on board at Keto inside the video. Obviously, permanent beds, 30-inch cotton, um, you know, control traffic, and, and we're looking to try and sequest as much carbon through our farming systems as we possibly can. 
uh, once again, just all the all the buzz and noise right through the world in regards to to carbon is is just huge, um, especially especially with the China and the Xinjiang. Not a bit, not just uh, the carbon, but a provenance is becoming one of the biggest words because you've got to actually prove in many many countries now, otherwise you pay taxes that that garment where uh, you have to prove through uh, provenance and documentation of where your garment comes from. Um, I just go into a, a thing here, which I think is really important. I want to get across. I said it earlier that um, when you apply and invest in technology, you need to measure that result. I know it's an old slide and they're old dates, but the concept being that um, if you invest in technology, you need to measure it. One of the best things we've been a part of is the AgriPath uh, data set um, benchmarking system. Highly recommend it. Um, very professional, and we've had a lot of success in you know, having, um, being able to track what we do in regards to, you know, our, for instance, our, our labour per hectare or labour per bale, our R&M costs, all those sort of things you can track and pull up and get like for like in various valleys through the AgriPath system. So highly recommend anyone um, to go into um, benchmarking themselves to improve. Um, the next slide was just something that we've mentioned and touched on uh, that we had 20 years of data and engaged with uh, soil scientists from the University of Queensland. And, and that's the map showing where we were and where, we at, where we've come to. And we, 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 because this was shown to us, we then thought, thought about the storytelling and the positive impacts because we had made significant change in 2013. And you can see that significant graph um, there. Every field at Kita, every second year has got a soil test. And on that soil test happened to be our N, P and K and all our trace elements, but as well as soil carbon. So we've been able to track it. And that's, once again, I, I just keep on getting back to um, data collection and the power of data and what you can do with it. Allowed us to tell this story and to tell our branding. Um, you can see the power of soil sequestration in regards to emissions and, you know, your fuel and your, and your transport, your ginning, um, all your uh, production, um, emissions are negligible compared to the power of soil sequestration through plants. Um, just onto the farm and some technologies, you know, a lot, lot of this is old, just to, but I just want to touch base. Obviously, we've used EM surveys on every paddock for sort of 20 odd years. The elevation data you get from your, your farming systems these days and what we've mentioned, well, I think we've got over 250 odd sensors now on the farm. Obviously, a lot of our soil probes We've got uh, sensors in all our fuel tanks, our pump stations, our pumping channels, um, giving us data. And I'll talk about that a little bit more on the Bankless channel. Um, just, um, you know, this was a classic example, once again, very old data, but what you can do with um, technology and how it can affect yield. There's a, on the top left-hand corner, you can see a, a photograph and, a, and a, the different growth rates of, of the crop. But then you can see a variable rate application map being developed from 800 down to zero. And then you can see what the crop actually did towards harvest time, how it evened out and that um, and the yield map in the bottom right hand corner. So the application of technology and the improvement of crops is um, certainly something that we track and measure. Um, irrigation is probably the biggest area that we've um, focused on in, in developing and applying technologies. We've had Nathaniel mentioned it in the video that we've got a site there the Guida Valley irrigators that we've uh, been measuring water use efficiencies with the four different types of irrigation systems. Um, this system here, I'll probably flick between the, this slide and the next slide. Bankless Channel um, has been a long-term uh, thing that we've been looking at for over five years. We went to many, many places in the south, which where it first started, then up to St. George, which was a, a big uptake of Bankless Channel. And some two or three years ago, we started our backless channel investment and we're now um, getting close at the end of this year will be 30% of our farm will be bankless channel. The benefits are endless. Um, the control of water, less tire water. We've measured our tire water in this system being from 45% through um, pipes down to 5% using bankless channel, all due to the fact that you can control your water in, in that last bay with the tiered system. Obviously that relates to less fuel. The labor saving is enormous. The accuracy improves. 
enormous amount of less maintenance, no head ditches, no rotor bucks, no siphons. Um, obviously, the, the uh, effect, the, the, the speed at which you can irrigate, the machinery efficiencies, um, I believe that there will be a significant premium in the asset value of your farm because of all these benefits. Um, uh, obviously, a lot less silt that gets moved. And we've not had any uh, yield difference. Actually, we're looking at yield improve, slight improvements um, by, by converting our land to bankless channel. Obviously, it's something that can be in the future fully automated. So there's a sensor on the right-hand side of that slide. You can see a sensor that collects data every time that um, that uh, weir board has been pulled. Um, it, it records the level at which it was uh, pulled at, of which you can then, the CSI are writing an algorithm to automate um, this system, which is 500 hectares in this, in this design. Um, and for next year, we're looking to fully automate it from the supply channel right through to the... Um, right through to the tile water. So it's pretty exciting. I'm very passionate about my bankless channel and I'm just gonna to continue to invest in it because I can't think of anything better to invest my money in. Um, obviously we've done some research into the, through the bank pipes. I think there's a, I'm not giving it, I'm not, not giving up on it, but uh, we've automated that. We're using iPads and, you know, whether iPhones, but it's um, certainly not as good as the bankless channel, but it's something that we're gonna to continue to look at and investigate. I'm not giving up on it, but um, obviously the expense of the permanent through the banks that are automated, they're quite expensive. You need ex extreme accuracy. Um, but uh, some trials that we did that were, were successful, but um, economics needs to improve. Obviously our laterals, we've done a lot of work on our laterals. Um, just the change in machinery. I just put this slide up just to talk about the improvements in um, planting technology, the precision seeding solutions, planters that we've bought this year. It's got each individual furrow force, press, uh, new press wheel designs. We've got now carbon cameras on the back of uh, two or three rows. So we're capturing data every time we go up and down the field with the planters, better diagnostics. But you can see there on the left-hand side, the accuracy and the results, you, you, the uh, maps you get from the planters going up on, you know, measuring multiple seeds going in, any the red is the skip seed and as individual seed going to that slot is on your green. So that the data capture you can get out of those things. I'm also mentioned that John Deere, um, as many of you may know or may not know that their automated uh, tractors are coming to the market at the end of this year, which is pretty exciting. We put our hand up to be involved with that. First up, um, I think that's going to be a bit of a revolution. And I'm sure the uptake that in Australia will be fairly significant. Um, a lot of things that we're tracking, we track all our vehicles, we track our tractors, and uh, a lot of you, a lot of farmers would be using all these systems where your start and stop times, all your engine data is recorded. And we're going to, we're working on the ability in the longer term to be this, all these emissions of these machines going into a platform where we can measure carbon on the go and their emissions so we can collect it real time. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the Gowana telemetry technology, we've got over 250 sites now on the farm, uh, measuring all our pump stations, our dam levels, fuel levels, and importantly, probably the most important one is the channel heights in front of the pumps. Rain events like we've had in the last couple of days, you can be very efficient. You know, we've got 35 kilometers to get over, there's only two people. There's, th there's um, 36 pump stations. So there's a, a lot of efficiencies where they got guys pull up their channel heights and work out, you know, where the most rain and where the water is to start the pump so they can go there first. Really effective uh, way of utilizing technology. Fiber trace, I've already touched on that in the video. I just wanted to touch on it with some of the slides that we've done. It's an investment that we've made to track our cotton. It all started with my wife's passion to follow our, our, um, our own cotton through. Um, through to our own uh, fibre coming back into the country for her own brand. She was very passionate about it. Um, I took her to many mills and you could quite easily see all the blending that occurred, the tags getting ripped off, uh, the green washing that occurs around the world in Asian countries. And it's been come to, come to you know, the organic industry is rife for um, green washing and, um, you know, falsification of uh, uh, certification certificates. So we invested in this technology 
Um, we showed you some of the, I'll just point out to you in the bottom right hand corner, you can see that which was in the video, the uh, scanner. It's a rare earth mineral that's melted down in, into a, into a uh, liquid form with cellulose fiber. It's then extruded the cellulose inside the fibers of which you got luminescent pigments that then light up with the scanner. That's like a radio signal that picks up that signal that we've created for ourselves. And then those five green lights come on the scanner. You press the white button that goes to a blockchain that we've developed. Um, so it then gives a map, which you're all showing for the further slides. One thing that um, is pretty interesting that cotton, conventional cotton sitting in all these fashion houses around the world, it goes into a benchmark for fibers and we sit second last. How does cotton sit below polyester? I'll never know. One of, the, one of the things that's driving us is to tell our story, to tell how well we do it, to tell our carbon positivity, so we can increase, you know, get, get off these scales. How does cotton sit in class E compared to class A with nylon and polyester? Got no idea. It's about educating brands, edu educating the people inside the brands to, to tell them a different story. You know, that once again, you can see there from, from good to bad and, and, and polyester sits third highest and cotton sits fourth last. Like, that's unbelievable. Lack of education, if you ask me. Um, fiber trace the cycle. I'll just give you a bit of a, we've built a, 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 um, a blockchain technology, which a brand portals log into, which then tracks the cotton. Every single um, space there is it actually where it's been scanned from the farm to the mill, from the gin to the mill, to the mill, to the fabric maker, to the dyer, to the spinner, to the garment maker and to the brand. So you can, we're starting to track the whole life cycle of the fabric itself. And so we can tell a story. There you can see we've developed um, technologies where you can actually see the life cycle. You can press on that button. You can see a world map of where it's been, your carbon score, the energy used and the water used. So we're trying to collect data right the way through the supply chain. Um, that's just the Good Earth Cotton, the Reformation ad that I played earlier. Um, and we're trying to, as my wife says, every fibre tells a story. Um, I don't need to play that video. And um, that's about all. I'll leave it to any, any questions coming through from, from the floor. But that's just our journey and our story. And um, the, our, our objective is to share our fibre trace and our Good Earth Cotton story with other growers. We needed, it's taken us three or four years to to actually get a premium for this, get it out in the world marketplace and get brands engaged. We've done that successfully in the last 12 months. And we'll be looking in the next 12 months to broadening that to other farmers and um, uh, getting a good earth cotton um, uh, protocol out there with other farmers and using the fiber trace technology to tell positive cotton stories and, and to be rewarded for it. So that's our journey. And thanks again for inviting me to present Guy. Great, thank you, David. Uh, you might unshare your screen. Shall yeah, no, that was terrific. Now I know a little bit potentially about how I could uh, track where my cotton shirt may have came from or where these cotton bales sitting behind me might be heading. Uh, I'd love to know more. We're obviously growing a little bit of dryland cotton ourselves here and it'd be good to know more about how it moves through the international marketplace and will that cotton end up back here on my jeans or somebody else's? Well, sure. But, uh, now, if anyone has any questions, you're welcome to put them in the chat bar. We've got 10 minutes or so. We can have some questions time. I think that's the best way. If you want to ask a question, stick it in the chat bar. But just while some people are doing that, uh, you mentioned there back in one slide earlier, I might have missed it, in 2013, you, you showed the soil carbon levels and you made a significant practice change. But I didn't quite catch what you did in 2013 that led to the soil carbon levels starting to rise. Yeah, Guy, that's a good question. Um, so that was put to us because we worked, we did this backward. It was re-engineered because we had the data. And when we, when you've got someone who's professional and understands the greenhouse gas protocol, understands soil carbon, they put the questions to us. We did, first of all, we went to um, 30 inch cotton. We went to permanent beds with hundred percent rotation, improved our water management. Um, and, and tillage equipment, I think the biggest change is that the amount of tillage that we were doing 20 years ago, turning soil, has completely changed today. You know, we were doing 10, 12 passes 
15 years ago and today we're doing three or four and they're all light passes. There's no deep tillage. And, and Nick mentioned in the video about you know, aggressive tillage practices, releasing carbon into the air. So I think that's by just by investing in machinery and changing our tillage practices over time. And, and that leads into your, your rotation. If so, if you're not back to back, your tillage practices are a lot more softer. Um, you, you know, and the and the planning technology that's directorial training planning technologies improve. So I think that that sort of wraps up the reason why that increase started to occur. And uh, you mentioned you've got something like 250 sensors, so that must lead to a lot of data and uh, keep managing all that data. What have you found as being one of the main challenges of organising that data, if you like, and then... Well, the organiser, yeah, the software platforms that it comes up on, we've all got Gawana, we've got all our fuel, there's big 23 or four fuel tanks, um, so we're working with Goana. They've got growing pains. They've grown quite extraordinary and they've got a lot of investment coming on board. But it's, it's about getting new people into agriculture. And in some of these fields, engineers, electrical engineers and people that can service these um, sensors, because you start to rely on them. And when they don't work, you know, that's, that's, that's a real issue um, because, you know, there was only one fuel tank out of 23 that wasn't working. And now that what they've done, working with them, they've now made it red. So if it's not re if it hasn't read live in the last 10 minutes or whatever time frame they put in, they've made that red. So you can look at it and you can see the red ones because we actually ran out of fuel on that pump station because yeah. the guy relied on it so much. So these are some of the issues. It's, it's about working with the companies on these sensors and making sure they've got the ability to continue to service. Well, we've got to bunch of young bright students sort of listening and uh, you know have you got a you got an app that you'd like them to invent for you or is there some sort of something that's uh being you're finding a bit challenged at a bunch of uh bright students could there's still an app out there that you hypothetically would like to have oh well we've got not that i can think of guy but just the concept yeah. of data collection in agriculture is just going to be so um such a big area you know you can I just, I'll mention um, Soil uh, Farm Lab, Sam Duncan. I know there's a lot of people from UNE and potentially watch this. And that was a startup company. He's done a great job. He's specialised in a field that I think is going to be so relevant because our farming practices, that's the measurement of the sustainability of your farming practices. I mentioned earlier that our objective is to understand our natural state. And our natural state, as Nick suggested in the video, is... Uh, you know, as 200 years ago, we've never been grazed, we've never farmed it. What is our natural state? I think Ketar's natural state's around that 0.5 to 0.6 soil carbon. So our aim is to be better than natural state, you know, continue to farm it, not mine the soil. There are so many farmers that, A, don't know what's happening under the ground, and they mine. They mine in. They know nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, all their trace elements, and their soil carbon, they're miners. And we don't want to do that. We want to be continue sustainable farm. Our land is our asset. Our soil is our biggest asset. And we need to understand what's happening under the ground, measure it. So a startup company, get, getting back to technology, has done a great job with all the different sciences he uses. He, he develops a, heaps of soil carbon maps for your whole farm. And he's got a methodology that, can, that is adaptable to the greenhouse grass protocol, which is GPS location points, the same point every year. And um, he's got a methodology of how to take those soil tests. So that's a great example of a company, startup company that's developed an app and a, and a methodology and just specialised in soil carbon. Yeah, well, there's an old analogy with plants. That plants are a bit like icebergs. There's more of them underneath the ground than what's above the ground. And that's you know, links to the soil and the quality of the soil. So I've got a couple of questions here. I've got a, well, one of them, first of all, is what has been the challenge in data management? And what other, uh, and link to that, and what is the strategy to work with? How do you work with other companies who want to share their data? Talking to as many companies as I can all the time. Um, we potentially do collaborations with John Deere. You think about the data that John Deere captures every day. They are a data center that is not capitalizing on what they're doing. So we're looking to collaborate with John Deere the RDO dealership 
people that own the John Deere dealerships in the Eastern Seaboard. That's just an example of someone that's got so much data that we that is being unutilized to date. Um, but the challenges around data, as I said before, is is um, you know what platforms, how does it come in? You know the Gawana platform is really good because it's precise. You got all your rain gauges, you got your soil probes, you got your you know, your water systems, your fuel tanks, all on one app. It's a really you know you got 250 data points coming into one application, so that works really well. It's just the reliability that's got to improve. Um, and then now you've got all your sensors on your automated uh, bankless channel sensors as well, all on the yeah. same thing. And been having the ability to drive around the farm, play, press a button on a on an iPad, and open and close irrigation gates, supply channels. It's um it's pretty rewarding when you get to that point. But it is challenging. It's challenging because um there we're early adopters. The companies to tend to grow outpace their growth, and they can't support what's in behind them. So you know we've learned a lot of lessons, and it's, it's the ability to be able to service. The next consistently service in rural areas in remote locations technologies to get the reliability that's the big, been the biggest challenge sounds like that's been the biggest challenge but also the biggest learning having that reliability of service so when these yeah. things break just like engines break i guess and, right. and getting them serviced you know whether it's probably a bit of soldering iron electric cable and rather than a grease gun and a, and a wrench True. Even and we've had to invest in our own on-farm telecommunications. We've spent a lot of money on that. We're coming, we've got our own pipe, 100 megabits per second coming out to the offices and the houses. And we've got the LoRaWAN system across the farm. So we've got reliable, but we've had to invest in that ourselves. And that's something that's um, pretty critical, telecommunications, because it's the whole basis of everything that we're investing in is data collection remotely. And you need tele reliable telemetry telecommunication systems to to deliver that to you. you try, some of this data that these companies collect, uh, you know, it's kept up in the cloud and actually for farmers don't have access to it. Do you, how do you manage that? Do you make well, sure? Well, we use, um, we've had a relationship with Andrew Smart down there in Narrabri for many, many years. So he's a, a data point where we get to analyse a lot of the data. Yeah. Um, but just having the skill set, not, um, you know, what we learned, we've captured all this data. We've used the PAM system, which is now going to the cloud. I know there's AgriWeb, there's other data points. But to have a data set of every fat paddock for the last 20 odd years in a PAM software system where you've got every operation, every input that's occurred on every paddock for 20 years is so powerful. And that's allowed us to tell the story that we've been able to tell. Yeah. Now, I've got a specific question here on Fibertrace, actually. Is fibre quality information tracked with fibre trace or is it more about tracking the sustainability? Um, good question. All the data is there because you've got the data from the classing results uh, by the bale that goes so you can, yeah, so the data is the fibre characteristics would be in the, um, the bale itself and the bale itself is then tracked. So it is possible to capture all that data. It then goes into a yarn which goes into a fabric, say a 40 count yarn, and then it goes into fabric. And each time, each process, it's being able to be scanned, tracked, time and date. And that signal has to come up each time. Now, if that signal starts to go down from five bars to three bars, we know it's been blended. And that's where that's where we got them. And they can no longer say it's 100% Australian because it's most of it is BS. It's it's. I've been there, I've seen it, and I've done it, and that's why we did what we did, because sick and tired of having stories being told that weren't true. Where's my, where, so what countries or is most of your cotton going to? or what? Um, so a lot of you? our main countries we're concentrating on is Vietnam. Turkey was probably the biggest one. Um, Vietnam, Bangladesh, India. So they're the, they're the four or five leading countries, and also Indonesia. Yeah, right, okay. I've got another question here. It's probably from a student asking what strategies could they adopt into the future to help farmers better adopt digital technologies? That's a good question. Um, yeah, I'm glad you're uh, answering it. What, what strategies? Um, learn, I suppose the big thing is to is that most farmers need help in working out what, what is the best way to capture data. What's the best way to capture every plant that's, um, 
you know, every field, there's every operation that happens on every field needs to be captured. So you need to put in systems that make it easier for farmers to capture that data. It's not hard, you're doing it. It's just a matter of, instead of writing it down on a pad, put it in a database that, get, that can be called upon in the future. And you can get some value out of that data by telling me what's my emissions, what's my CO2, you know, what I'm burning all this fuel, I'm using this much energy, I've used this much chemical, what does that mean with emissions? Uh, what's happening under my ground, capturing that data. Um, so understanding um, data systems, what's the best one to use, edu helping farmers educate themselves and, and giving a service to farmers. If you're a young, starting your own business and going to farmers and helping them collect their data would be a, a little business model that, that I could suggest for young people to do because they're not that good at it. Farmers are very good at what they do. It's, you know, it's it's not in their skill set, you know, writing things down, it's a pain in the ass. But if someone could come on board and, and capture that and help them with that service and work out how they can do that with apps or remotely would be um something that would be a good business going forward for some young people. Yeah, well, you're right. They're, farmers are very busy. They're just diverse yeah. businesses and they just, you just can't do everything yourself, can you? So, no. No. Now, well, that probably leads on to... Uh, you know, what advice you'd have to any students leaving, about to leave ag or about to leave university, rather, um, what they should think about? Well, the biggest thing that I've ever I said to my boys, that number one, two, three, number 10, right? Number one to 10 is attitude. If you've got the right attitude and the will and want to do something, you need to find a purpose in your world. And my purpose is to supply food and fiber to the world and leave the world a better place. So that's my passion. You've got to find a passion and you've got to have the right attitude because with the right attitude, you can, you can do anything. Um, but this data world, this, the world that they're growing up in with these apps, data capture, um, you know, these, this world of, um, uh, you know, that they're growing up in the social media world is, um, is a world that is sort of leaving me behind a little bit. And there's so many opportunities there um, that I can see, you know, working with companies like Gawana, something like Padman Stops and, you know, all these companies are supplying us these services. They haven't got enough young people to help them um, manage and, you know, add, add extra services about data capture and, and then analysing that data. Andrew Smart's a great, a, a, a great business model in Narrabri that's, you know, it's the data capture and then analyses that data. So we get a lot of value out of someone else, you know, saying here's all the data, now what can you tell us, you know, AgriPath do a tremendous job with that benchmarking and that's data capture and then being able to change your practices based on the data that they give you. Thanks. We've actually actually come to the end of our allotted time. So we've had some good, uh, great questions and really great presentation. I said at the start, you had plenty of passion and you really, really show on that through this presentation for agriculture. And, and you, there's some pretty clear messages I thought about how do we decommoditize agriculture and what we do, uh, particularly in northwest New South Wales, we're largely producing commoditized crops with wheat, cotton, chickpeas, or whatever. How do we decommoditize? How do we value add? And you also gave some examples of how you the importance of the value of data. And you alluded to it might even be an asset on a balance sheet. 100%. Which is really something to think about mm. long term. And I have some examples of how some Big companies are getting value out of data and using data, but also some small companies. You mentioned two, two of them are really quite small companies, but in a way, great examples to uh, yeah. any young listeners, how you could, entrepreneurs who could get off there, uh, really make some value and extract some value, help farmers. It was all about helping farmers, having service, that sort of thing. So it's Lots been terrific, David. Thank you very much. Thank you, Guy. Lots of opportunities out there for young people and get into agriculture. I can't recommend it highly enough. Love it, mate. Love it. Well, well there you go. Study agriculture and then get into it. That's what we want to do. Thank you. So everyone have a great day and thanks for joining. Thanks, See you later. Bye.